beings from another dimension have access to influence the lives of people on Earth. Are demons and other disembodied spirits real? Join us in this episode as we explore the world of demons, exorcisms, and unclean spirits. What happens when people try and contact demonic spirits to gain spiritual insight? Is it possible to outsmart these ancient entities? There's a spiritual realm and a spiritual reality that exists around each and every one of us right now. There's nothing that you can do in your physical reality that does not have spiritual implications. In the realm of the spirit, I want you to think about cell phone signals and TV and Wi-Fi and all of these different signals that are being sent around us right now. Now we can't actively see those with the naked eye, but we know that they're carrying information and this information is being transmitted around us 24 seven. It is the same for the realm of the spirit. There are ideas and essences, ghosts, spirits, fairies, pixies, angels, demons, all of these things far beyond what the human mind could ever comprehend. This has taken place in you and around you at every given moment. Demons. Almost every holy book on the planet speaks about interaction with these malevolent beings. Nearly everyone today is familiar in some way to the concept. But what exactly are they? What is their possible influence on humans? Demons are spoken of 75 times in the New Testament and were an important part of Jesus Christ's teachings. Although their origins are debated, it is primarily accepted that demons can affect humans in a number of ways, including physical illnesses, mental impairments, false beliefs, spiritual warfare, and even possession. According to Genesis 6 and Enoch 6, demons are basically the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim, which the Nephilim were the descendants of the fallen angels who came down and married human women, and their descendants spread across the world. The book of Enoch talks about the angels that came down and left their habitation from heaven and took wives for themselves. This is also reiterated in Genesis chapter 6 when we talk about the giants or the Nephilim. And so when those angels left their first abode, their habitation, and came to earth, took wives for themselves. Uh, it was forbidden by God. Those angels and the women bore children, and those children were called the Nephilim. And these were the giants that were on the earth in those days. The demons are the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim from Genesis 6 and Enoch 6. What many people don't realize is that whenever God told the Israelites to go into the Promised Land and kill all the, the, the cities of the nations, those were the descendants of the Nephilim. It is also believed that Goliath and his brothers were the offspring of these fallen angels. The Book of Enoch goes into great detail about these beings who chose to fall from grace and take wives for themselves among the humans. It is said that these giants were wicked and ate humans as a delicacy. When those children died, their spirit couldn't ascend into heaven. So they were trapped in the earth realm, in the ethers, which is the air around us. And so it says that they torment mankind, that they cause men to do treacherous deeds upon the earth. And essentially they have to have a host they have to have a body because they remember the life that they had on the earth before when they had their own physical bodies. And so they lust for greed, they lust for power, for blood, and to do wickedness upon the earth. And so they can't feel any feelings or sensations or, or get any pleasure unless they have a host. And so this is where they like to possess people. They have to have a human that they will possess so that they can feel what it feels like again to commit murder robbery, stealing, uh, even eating food and gorging themselves on meats and wines and things like that. The evil spirit cannot taste the delicacies uh, from the earth unless they have a host. Many of the women who bore these children died while in labor. These beings caused wickedness upon the face of the earth. Enoch also describes a final war between the Nephilim, 
many people believe that the main reason for the flood of Genesis was to wipe out the existence of these angel-human hybrids and to eradicate their presence from the face of the earth. In Greek tradition, the Nephilim are personified as the gods and titans. And so the scripture says that they are here for a time until the great judgment. There are multiple types of demons um, in demonology, just like there is a hierarchy for angels or the angelic in the heavenly realms, there is also a hierarchy for demons. Uh, but demonology is the study of the demonic realm, the different rankings, different demons, what they do, uh, how they're controlled, what their names are. When it comes to the idea of angels and demons, a lot of people think that those are just two types of spirits that are in the ethers. Uh, demons would be something that are negative and the angels are these guardian spirits that watch over humanity. But the truth is that even biblically speaking, there's a hierarchy and a pecking order when it comes to these spirits. Just for an example, the Bible talks about evil spirits, evil angels, unclean spirits, and a lot more when it comes to this ranking of demons and evil spirits. The interesting thing is that even within religion and church culture, uh, some of these subjects when it comes to spirituality or demons and angels and things like that become a little bit taboo. But what we got to understand is that 90% of Jesus' ministry was dealing with people who were vexed with evil spirits. 90% of Jesus' ministry was casting out demons. Christ often confronted and cast out demons and gave his disciples the power to cast out demons as well. Today, we call this exercise an exorcism. In an exorcism, a higher authority is called upon to bind the entity, to then control or command it to act contrary to its own will. According to scripture, Jesus is a higher authority that demons recognize and fear. Catholic priests also call upon the Archangel Michael, who is believed to have the power to defeat evil beings as well. Going into people's houses, exercising the house, exercising it from people, that's, that's basically deliverance ministry, and many times demonology and deliverance ministry are married together. When it comes to legal ground or how demons can gain access to us, we have to realize that our body is a temple. And so if we are getting into something, studying something, reading something, listening to something, whether it's, you know, seances, ujib, or anything that has, you know, has a ne negative connotation of the occult, you are in severe danger of opening up doors that can be catastrophic. So the angels and the demons and all of these beings, they are all created with a job and with a duty to carry out within the spirit realm and they make things happen on the earth. It is believed that there are the spirits that record the deeds of mankind and report back to the Father every night with what has happened on the earth, with the push and pull of the currents of the, the sea and the wind and all of these things, that there are spirits and elements that are over all of this stuff. Possession might be defined as the direct action of the devil, operating on an individual whose own sins had exposed them to this terrible fate. It is crucial to realize that a possession can't and won't occur without the consent, however minimal, of the victim. This consent predominantly takes the form of past sins and regrets. When a person is demonically possessed, he or she suffers from a complete seizure of their personality by a diabolical being. This allows the demon to dominate their person, allowing them to become, even somewhat physically, that demonic being. Because the demons need permission in order to gain access to us. They cannot gain access unless they have legal hold or legal permission. This is also where it gets into demonic possession and oppression as well, that people are vexed or demonized by these evil spirits because the different deeds that they do, they open themselves up to evil spirits. And these are some things that are forbidden in the Bible where it's 
making packs with entities for secret knowledge and doing a lot of different things that open yourself up to become susceptible to these demons and you give yourself legal ground between you and that spirit to be in your auric field around your body. Now listen to me. I want you out of your body, you hear me? Come out. Come out. Come out. Out of his body. Out of his body. Out. Out. Come all the way out. 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 Fire the whole year. Come out. Come out. Freedom. So someone who is vexed with an evil spirit, you have to understand that there is legal ground that that entity has in your life. Now it could be some of the deeds or sins of the flesh that you're sinning against your own body. You are doing things on the earth that aligns with the frequency of these beings and you give them legal access to your life by the type of life that you're living. They know things about you that only you know. And so I have been in deliverance ministry where we've been helping individuals overcome some of their demonic strongholds in their life. And we've been in the middle of the process of helping that person get free from those spirits. And in the middle of it, the individual who's going through the exorcism, a voice will come out of them and speak to one of the individuals helping the exorcism and it will call out something, one of their deepest, darkest fears one of their insecurities. And I've seen grown men in the middle of these exorcisms get shaken to their very core. Leave a body. Leave a body, you spirit. There's many of us. <laughs> and it would be something as someone who is, is dealing with a type of sin that they're trying to hide or um, anger issues or things like that. I've seen them call it out and it renders that person powerless because that spirit knew something within them that they were trying to hide. It, essentially, it was a, a wound or a trauma that, that that person hasn't dealt with yet. And the demon seen that as a chink in their armor and called it out. And I've seen it cripple people in the middle of these exorcism services. If you repent or denounce whatever you did that opened the door for the demon to come into your life, the demon will no longer have access, will no longer have legal ground in your mind or your body. Once you have repented and renounced and, and the demon no longer has legal ground, that right there makes it so much easier for the deliverance minister to get the demon out of you, or sometimes it just comes out. It really just depends on how deep that thing is and how ingrained um, that demon is attached to you. Now I've seen people who were totally vexed with demonic spirits who would come to a, a meeting and they're, they can't even look you in the face. When you look at them, they're not even there. They're possessed with demonic spirits that are looking through their eyes, speaking to them, all types of stuff. We try to talk to them, they look away. We've seen them repent of their sin, ask for forgiveness, and renounce the very thing that they were doing that gave that demon legal ground. That person get healed and set free, and the next time you see that person, they're totally changed. It's like you're talking to a different person. Sigils. Throughout history, humans have been attempting to interact with the spirit realm. How could this possibly be done, and what are the consequences? King Solomon is said to have asked God for wisdom, and in return, God made Solomon the wisest man alive. In occult circles, it is generally accepted that one of the gifts Solomon possessed was the ability to summon, command, and control demons to do whatever he commanded. Some even believe that Solomon used this power to make these entities help construct the original Solomon's temple. In the Testament of Solomon, it is said that the Archangel Michael gave Solomon a ring with what is now known as the pentagram, and this sigil held control over these demons. A sigil is a seal or symbol that is encoded with a specific purpose. It is believed by some that the use of sigils allows one to play an active role in their spiritual path. 
and by controlling spiritual entities, a person could better control their own life circumstances. Through my studies and research, I found that most of the time, these entities want to have some type of presence in our reality. And this is when we come to the idea of signs, symbols, and sigils. A sigil is a magical inscription that one gains from an angel or a demon or a jinn that when you draw it down, when you write this sigil, then the entity appears before you. So what we see is that these entities have these signs and symbols that didn't exist until they gave it to you. And now they have some type of physical resemblance within the physical world. People who try to summon the demons, they originally try to use them to gain knowledge and essentially enslave them. But what happens is the demons then turn it around on them and end up possessing those people. So whenever a person is trying to summon a demon in order to get knowledge and power, the demon will entice the person with knowledge and various other aspects, but in turn, the person becomes enslaved to the demon versus the demon being enslaved by the person. One of the places where these entities wish to reside on our plane of existence is within the mind of the practitioner. The entities want to live within your mind. And this, if one is not careful, will always lead to vexation of spirit as well as demonic possession causing an individual to go mad. Now also when it comes to the paranormal, people use Ouija boards to try to consult or contact spirits that may be around them or living in that house. And that is one of the quickest ways to become demonically possessed is to play with a Ouija board. Individuals will use the Ouija board and try to consult with spirits that are within the house. And most of the time this is so-called disembodied spirits or ghosts. But just because someone has crossed over to the other side does not mean that they're enlightened. They have not ascended just because they're on the other side. Again, when people go into houses that are haunted and people begin to get vexed and have nightmares and dreams and feel like they're being watched in the middle of the night, many times it's because they've opened up portals to the other side with the use of something seemingly as innocent as a Parker Brother game called the Ouija board. The problem that arises time and again when attempting to contact and control entities for a person's own personal agendas and gains is that complete control never truly occurs. When doing rituals and summonings, a person does invite these beings or entities into their lives. Once that door is open, even with all the precautions taken to control the process, these entities or demons tend to find a way to counter-manipulate and get permission to linger around in that person's life. From there, oftentimes the person who thought they had control of the situation finds themselves victims to torments, harassment, physical threats, emotional deterioration, destruction of families, and even possession in some instances. And we also find out about this chief of the demons as well. Many people like to attribute it to Satan or Lucifer or something like that. But the chief of demons, it says in the scriptures, is Beelzebub. Now it's only mentioned one time throughout the entirety of the Bible, but when you open up the Testament of Solomon, it goes into great detail about Beelzebub and the other rankings of demons, their jobs, their duties, as well as the angels that are put over them that have authority to bind and to loose them as well. So when we're talking about spirituality, when we're talking about casting out demons, Jesus understood this. Because when we read in the scriptures, Jesus was accused of actually working with demons to cast these demons out. And then Jesus gives veneration to Solomon, where Solomon had the authority over these spirits. But then Jesus goes a little bit further and says that you have one who is greater than Solomon with you now. The Jinn. Extra-dimensional life forms known as the Jinn are spirits who inhabit an unseen world in dimensions beyond the visible universe of humans. Together, the Jinn, humans, and angels make up the three sentient creations of God. The Quran mentions that the Jinn are made of a smokeless and scorching fire, and they have the physical property of weight. 
Like human beings, the jinn can also be good, evil, or neutrally benevolent, and hence have free will like humans and unlike angels. Now when we think about the Islamic tradition, we hear about the notion of these beings called the jinn. And the jinn essentially are what we would call demons, or these low, lower level vibrational entities that exist. And it is said that if you can catch a jinn, that the jinn will be able to give you wishes, fame, and fortune, that if you can catch these jinn. Now, coincidentally, the word jinn ties into genie, and the genie with the magical lamp, as we see in the movie Aladdin. If you can find the lamp, that the genie will come to you, that reside within the lamp, and grant you three wishes. Hence the idea of individuals wanting to work with demons, capture demons, so that they can extract secret knowledge from them. Knowledge about the cosmos, about the heavens, and about the realms of the unknown. But be wary when it comes to working with these type of entities. Things are not always as they seem. A common trick used against a malevolent jinn was to play into its need to show how powerful it was, tricking the spirit into re-entering his lamp or jar, and then sealing it, trapping the demon within before he could return to cause harm to his summoner. Sleep Paralysis Imagine waking up in the middle of the night and you notice that you're awake but you can't move. You feel this dread in the atmosphere. Or you see this shadowy being somewhere in your room. This is what thousands of people across the globe report experiencing. This is what is called sleep paralysis or old hag syndrome. Between eight and 50% of people experience sleep paralysis at some point in their life. About 5% of people have regular episodes. It is believed to have played a role in the creation of stories about alien abduction and other paranormal events. You are either paralyzed and you just can't move, and sometimes even the, uh, the demon's trying to siphon the life from you. People experience this and because of various different things, whether dabbling in stuff that they shouldn't be, or it could be an attack from the enemy to try to scare you away from the direction the Father is leading you. A lot of times when this phenomenon happens, people report waking up at 3.33 a.m. This is what's known as the witching hour. It is said that the veil between the spirit world and our reality are at its lowest, and the spirits pass from the ethers to our reality a lot easier. Many people report waking up and seeing beings in their room and all types of other phenomena. The night hag is a generic name for a folkloric creature found in cultures around the world and is used to explain the phenomenon of sleep paralysis. A common description is that a person feels a presence of a supernatural malevolent being, which immobilizes the person as if standing on the chest. This phenomenon goes by many names. Now with sleep paralysis and the old hag syndrome, people are again waking up and seeing these grotesque beings, sometimes screaming in their face when it comes to the old hag syndrome. Many people wake up and see beings laying on top of their chest. They can't breathe, they can't move, they can't speak, and they experience sheer terror within their rooms. The one thing I find very fascinating is that Regardless of what religion or belief system you hold, atheist, Muslim, it does not matter. They have all testified that no matter what they do, they cannot break free of this thing except for uttering one word, Jesus. Utter the name and it will immediately stop. No matter how much trouble you are having with vocalizing it because they will try to muffle your voice. They will try to make it so that you cannot speak. You are mute, but it is possible. Once you speak that name, it, it immediately stops. Of all the different religions, all the different belief systems that are out there, why 
this one word? Why not Buddha? Why not Muhammad? Why Jesus? Because his name is above every other name. Two other entities that people report dealing with in the middle of the night against their will are the incubus and the succubus. And so these are spirits that are said to get on people when they're asleep and harass them sexually. Many people will become aroused and things like that and something is rubbing them, something is accosting them against their will. And this goes all the way back from the Solomonic tradition as the incubus and the succubus spirits. So with that being said, I definitely discourage anyone to try to consult an evil spirit, a demon, a disembodied spirit, um, to try to consult them for knowledge because it always ends up biting you on the tail. It's never, never good. So when we think about angels and demons, again, the word angel simply means messenger. And when we're thinking about demons as well, the demons carry messages also. If one commits their life of sin and debauchery and murder and lying, cheating and stealing, that you align yourself with the beings on the other side that operate at that vibrational frequency. So when we're talking about possession, when you align yourself with the deeds that those spirits are associated with, you begin to see their handprint in your life. And, and this essentially is the sovereignty of God, is how all of these beings, this whole hierarchy, and all the types and rankings and levels that they all work cohesively together to bring about God's perfect will upon the earth. If you think about ants, ants seem to be a nuisance to many people, but ants serve a specific purpose as preservers of the earth. Now I want you to think about certain demons and evil spirits as being preservers of the spirit realm as well. If you would drop a piece of candy or some old food on the ground and just forget about it and keep walking, ants get that scent and they come up and they clean the earth. It's out of mind, out of sight. The ants come up, clean the earth, and go back in and that piece of candy doesn't even exist anymore. It's the same way in the spirit world. The scripture says such things as pride cometh before a fall. Now, when one gets prideful and arrogant and that fall comes before them, you can think of a demon that is loosed, that has come to trip them up. For every deed, there is a cause of an equal or opposite reaction that happens in the spirit realm. And so demons are loose depending on the type of life that we live on earth. And they all are sent to teach us a lesson, the demons and the angels as well. I want you to think of microscopic organisms that are on your body right now. Now you can't see them with the naked eye, but if you have a microscope, a trained eye, you can see these amoebas and these little creatures microscopic organisms living on your skin, fighting one another. There's like this spiritual holy war that's taking place on your body, but you can only see them with a trained eye. The same is true for the realm of the spirit. There are entities and angels and demons and, and, and there's entities that have your greatest good in mind, but there's also malevolent spirits that want to harm you and use you and drain you of your energy and your life force. With everything, there's a right and a wrong way to do it. For those who are interested in the study of the spirit world, study of spirituality, the beautiful thing is we can go directly to God and He is the one who speaks to His children and loves to share the secrets. But we have to go directly to the Father. And so anytime that you try to go another route, you try to go in by working with demons or lower level entities, you always end up in the state of madness and confusion. It never ends good. There's scripture upon scripture where people were trying to consult demons and get secret knowledge and they were always rebuked. Why? Again, because you can go directly to God to understand whatever it is that he wants to show you.